This last May of 2021 was the 11 year anniversary of my podcast. Back in 2010, when I first started, podcasts were the Wild West. Hardly anyone had heard of them, even fewer people were listening, and only a tiny handful of us were producing them. I've had a blast doing nearly 300 episodes of the show over that 11 year period. And lately, I've been thinking a lot about what I'd like to do with the show over the next 10 years. I'm even more excited about podcasting today than I was when I started. And I'd love to ask for your input on how I can improve the show and make it even better, more relevant to your interests. To that end, I've created a brief survey, which should take only about three to five minutes to complete. I know most of you are busy, so as an expression of my appreciation for your time, everybody that completes the survey will be entered into a drawing for a free three-year membership to Thrive Market. I'm sure most of you have heard of Thrive Market. You can think of Costco meets Whole Foods online. You can buy some of the best uh, organic, natural food, and personal care products online at huge discounts compared to what you'd pay at something like Whole Foods. I use it every week, um, and it's it's really a, a game changer for those of us that are interested in healthy living. So again, you get uh, if you complete the survey, you'll get entered into a drawing for a free three-year membership to Thrive Market. So that's $180 value. And if you'd like to complete the survey anonymously, that's fine too. Just don't include your email address at the bottom of the form. You can find the survey at cresser.co slash podcast survey. Podcast survey is one word there. So that's cresser.co slash podcast survey. Oh, and one last thing. You might notice some changes or additions to the show over the next few months. This is just part of my process of research and experimentation to see what works best. Thanks in advance for participating and for being part of the Revolution Health radio community. I'm so grateful for your help. Hey everybody, this is Chris Kresser. Welcome to another episode of Revolution Health Radio. This week I'm really excited to welcome Marie Colby Zinnaker as my guest. She has a bachelor's degree in food science and a master's degree in nutritional biology. She worked in cancer research for several years before she turned to teaching, and she's currently working as a college lecturer teaching nutritional science and medical biology in Oslo, Norway. So I'm really looking forward to this conversation because one of the most common questions that I have gotten as a functional medicine practitioner over the last 10 years is, whether high cholesterol is always a problem. Uh, a lot of people switch to a low carb or even ketogenic diet to lose weight, improve their metabolic health, and they might find that their LDL cholesterol or LDL particle numbers skyrocket when they do that. And they are, of course, curious about whether that is as much of a problem as their doctor in the mainstream medical establishment would hold. And you know, we haven't really had a good answer to that question. There, there, I've talked about it on lots of previous podcasts and I've written a lot about it. But what I'm really excited to talk to Marit about is a new theory that she and her colleagues have developed, which would suggest that, uh, at least in some cases, high cholesterol and high LDL particle number may actually just be an appropriate physiological response and not pathogenic. In other words, they, they would not confer any additional risk of cardiovascular disease. So I know this will be of great interest to a lot of you, and uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by the theory. Uh, they've published a paper on it, and we're going to be talking all about the paper and the theory itself. So without further delay, let's dive in. Marit, thank you so much for joining me on the show. I've really been looking forward to this conversation. Thanks for having me on your podcast, Chris. I'm looking forward to it too. So where are you joining from? I'm joining from, from my office um, at um, the college I work at in, in Oslo right now. In Oslo. And that's in uh, which college? I, did, I couldn't pronounce it, so I didn't read it in the intro. <laughs> It um, has a Norwegian name. It's called Birkness University College. Birkness, okay. Private college. So we're going to be talking about a topic that's of great interest to uh, many of my listeners, which is whether uh, high LDL cholesterol 
you know, a high number of LDL particles in the bloodstream is always a pathological process that contributes to heart disease. And this is, in fact, probably one of the certainly in top three concerns that I've encountered in my professional career as a functional medicine clinician. It's one of the main reasons that people come to see me. It's one of the burning questions that people tend to you know, write in with or leave on the blog or ask in the podcast question submission. You know, very common scenario is uh, somebody goes on a low carb diet, you know, to, to address metabolic conditions, you know, over lose weight, improve their blood sugar, et cetera. And their LDL cholesterol skyrockets, their doctor freaks out, tells them they need to go on a statin and then they freak out and they, they come to me or, you know, try to find uh, at least a second opinion or another explanation for why that could be happening because oftentimes in that scenario, they feel so much better in every other way. They've lost weight, their blood sugars come down, their inf inflammatory markers have come down, everything else has improved across the board. And so just intuitively, it doesn't make a lot of sense to them that something that would improve so many other processes in the body would, would, would then lead to such a dramatic worsening of their cardiovascular disease risk. So uh, you have developed a model that could potentially explain a non-pathological reason for uh, LDL cholesterol increasing in some of these situations, which we're going to spend the, re the remainder of the podcast discussing. But before we do that, uh, maybe you could just talk a little bit about your background and, and how you got interested in this topic in the first place, because this is you know, one of the great sacred cows of nutritional science, and you're, you're definitely challenging the status quo here. And as we'll discuss, there's already predictably been some pushback and, and, and you know, critique of the model um, from people who are uh, still convinced of the diet heart hypothesis and its validity. So what made you decide to take on this challenge? Yeah, so this model was really born out of frustration from not being able to explain to my students what was going on when people would change their diet and then they would change their intake of dietary fatty acids and then cholesterol would change. And that intuitively doesn't make sense, right? If, if it was cholesterol that people were, and then the, the intake of cholesterol that was changing and then the cholesterol in the blood would change, that would make sense. But this just doesn't make sense. So I had students asking me that question and of course I asked myself that question, why does this happen? And, uh, and we see, um, of course, as we know, and probably many of your listeners know that eating a lot of, of uh, saturated fatty acids will increase on average the LDL cholesterol and then the polyunsaturated fatty acids will decrease on average the LDL cholesterol. But we didn't have an explanation for why that happened. And uh, every time I was teaching this topic, I would just go down these rabbit holes of, of research <laughs> and trying to find the answers and I couldn't really believe that no one had described these dynamics and what really happened to um, what happened at the molecular level because an increase or a decrease in these particles means a change in number of molecules and, and I couldn't find an explanation and I thought I would I, I had to be completely useless because <laughs> I couldn't find those papers and I couldn't find it in the textbooks and it was like blank pages and and I was so frustrated with this that I just started trying to figure it out myself. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, kudos to you for doing that because what is the typical response in that situation is just to assume that there must be an explanation because everybody else is going along with this. So you know, it, it, it must be something that either has been missed or you're, it's, it's unknowable or, or, or maybe we don't even really need to dig deeper there because this, this theory has been around for so long, it must be correct. So that it's not really useful to, to question it, which to me just blows me away because the whole purpose of science and scientific inquiry is to question our hypotheses, you know, and, and, and in some ways try to prove them wrong. That's, that's how you make progress in science. But I think because of some of our basic human tendencies, like groupthink, 
uh, becomes a real problem where uh, we don't want to be on the outside of uh, of a of a particular group. Most of us, at least, uh, because from an evolutionary perspective, that was risky. If we set ourselves apart from what the rest of the group was doing, you know, our our chances of survival were less. And even though that's not the case anymore for physical survival, probably it's still a big risk to to challenge the the dominant paradigm. So again, you know, kudos to you for for being willing to do that. Let's start with defining some terms because we're going to be throwing around some acronyms and and some terms and I don't want to assume that everybody knows what we're talking about. So let's start with the diet heart hypothesis. We've already used that term a couple of times in this discussion and I think most people are familiar with what it is, but let's re- let's let's tell them specifically what the diet heart hypothesis refers to because this is what your model is directly challenging. Yeah, sure. Uh, So the diet heart hypothesis is uh, resting on this three-step reasoning. And the first step is that a diet high in saturated fatty acids will, on average, (laughs) increase LDL and total cholesterol. And, uh, And that's been shown in countless studies. And then the second step is the association between an elevated LDL cholesterol in the blood and um, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, which we can call cardiovascular disease for simplicity. Or even CVD. We'll, we'll, we yes. might throw that term. CVD standing for cardiovascular disease. We're going to omit the atherosclerotic part because that's implied. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> so go ahead. That's that's uh, the step so two. That, so that's step two. And that's, uh, that's well documented as well. And then, pro- and then we do this sort of logical reasoning that of, since one is true and then two is true, then a high intake of saturated fatty acids will lead to um, CBD. Right. <laughs> so Just that's, a logical induction. A equals B, B equals C, the A, a equals yeah, C. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. So that's the, that's the diet Okay, hypothesis. so that's the diet heart hypothesis. And this is, of course, what we've been told for you know, at least 60 years, it's served as the kind of underpinning of the dietary guidelines in the US and in most other uh, countries in the world. It led us down the path of egg white omelets and boneless skinless chicken breasts and, and steamed broccoli and bagels with <laughs> bagels with no cream cheese and, and yeah, lo- low fat, everything um, for, and that's, you know, I think arguably over the last 10, 15 years that's shifted somewhat. And there's, there's, you know, changing attitudes about that, at least in the general public. But, um, you know, what are some of the shortcomings of this hypothesis? And we could spend several podcasts discussing the shortcomings, but maybe just from a 30,000 foot view, what are the biggest glaring issues with the diet heart hypothesis? So if we go back to that step one, uh, these are average numbers, and those averages don't don't really fit that many people. <laughs> so if we look at the, these actual interventions, because there are loads of interventions having been done, and and you could see that um, the, there's a huge variation in response. You yeah. give the same type of of same amount of saturated fatty acids to lots of different people, and they will respond very differently and for instance there was this Norwegian study on nutrition students um, published a couple of years ago where they saw they were put on a ketogenic diet with a very high um, intake of saturated fatty acids and the response varied from 5% increase to 107% increase (laughs) and that's typically what you see (laughs) and so you will see differences between individuals you will see that men and women tend to respond differently even though there aren't really that many studies in women uh, alone Uh, you will see seasonal variations to these types of um, responses Um, and uh, yeah there are loads of and and you'll see temporal variations too which we're going to talk about later meaning if you measure yeah. a week after they start the ketogenic diet, you're going to see very different numbers than if you measure two months after they've been on the ketogenic diet. 
yeah and and also there are differences between healthy people and unhealthy people they will respond differently so that's some of the problems with the step one yeah. but there's also a bigger problem with the step one like we that we talked about um in the beginning that we don't know the mechanism so we give advice based on changing these dynamics and we haven't understood the biological mechanism and that's pretty in interesting if you ask me yeah so those are a few of the shortcomings with the step one um and then there's uh, the step two uh, and of course we know these associations are uh, we know these associations that high ldl cholesterol is associated with uh with cvd but not everyone with a high ldl gets uh, problems mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's um so that's and not so everyone who has a heart attack has high LDL cholesterol. Exactly. On, on, exactly. on the flip right. side. Yeah. Um, and then there's the the step three, uh, and of course that's that's one of the <laughs> big problems that we haven't really. Uh, no studies have shown this causality. It, it just hasn't been demonstrated. Yeah, I so, want to linger on that for a second, just to make this abundantly clear to people that the whole step there's been a stepwise chain of reasoning where consuming more saturated fat leads to elevated cholesterol. Elevated cholesterol is associated with heart disease. Therefore, ergo, consuming saturated fat causes heart disease. But in what you're saying and what I've written about ad nauseum now and, and talked about in numerous podcasts, Joe Rogan, et cetera, is that there are no convincing studies that demonstrate that causal relationship between saturated fat intake and heart disease. When they've removed serum cholesterol as the middleman, so to speak, or as the, the, the mediator or the mechanism, and they just looked directly at the relationship between saturated fat intake and cardiovascular events, they see either, and correct me if, if, if you disagree, either not, no increase in cardiovascular events, or in the case of stroke, I've seen you know, large reviews that actually show a decrease in stroke incidents with a higher intake of saturated fat. Yeah, so, and I think you also went through all the evidence with uh, Zoe Harcomb in the previous yes. episode. So uh, it's, it's very clear that um, it, doesn't really, it doesn't really add up. Um, so I think that when something doesn't add up, we have to go back and look at, uh, at this, this reasoning and, and maybe we, we just misunderstood something along the way. Right. <laughs> that takes some scientific integrity and curiosity, which, uh, which uh, you know, fortunately, there are still many scientists out there who possess that. And unfortunately, I think, again, our basic human nature tends to work against us in, in, in some cases there. So let's talk a little more about intra-individual differences with uh, how, how saturated fat intake affects blood lipids and, and other things uh, physiologically. I, as a clinician, I can certainly attest to this myself, just anecdotally, uh, I see dramatic differences in, in the response to varying levels of saturated fat intake. You know, I, I'll, if somebody's overweight, for example, and their LDL particle number is high because of, you know, they have high triglycerides and not as, you know, the, the liver has to make more LDL particles in order to transport the same amount of, of nutrients around the body, including cholesterol, ketogenic diet can actually lower LDL in those people, in my experience. On the other end of the spectrum, I've seen people go from, you know, total cholesterol of 175 to 350 in a relatively short period of time, just from switching to a ketogenic diet. So what are some of the factors that determine this response, this variable response in individuals? Yeah, so we, we know that there are sex differences. Uh, we know that um, there are, of course, genetic differences. So those can also, loads of different genes <laughs> can yeah. and explain some of that variation. Um, and probably the habitual diet, uh, which is very related to what we are going to talk about or talking about today. Yeah. Um, and also, like you say, um, in people who are not metabolically healthy, there are loads of things that can go wrong and that can interfere with uh, with the lipid metabolism. So I guess there are there are many different factors that influence 
the, um, the specific response in an individual, but they still don't explain what happens at the molecular level. So that's, I think that's where the Hadle model is, is useful. And then if you, we could sort of um, remove some of that noise and then we could figure out a little bit more what's the significance of, of genetics or yeah, sex right. difference. All right, so we're getting to the point where I'm going to ask you to introduce the HADL hypothesis and, and break down that acronym, but I, w I want to do one more thing to kind of set the stage, which is uh, we know from, from studies that saturated fat intake doesn't increase the synthesis of cholesterol, nor does it increase or speed up the absorption of dietary cholesterol. And, and then on the flip side, we know that increased intake of PUFA or polyunsaturated fat, fatty acids, doesn't cause a decrease in synthesis or absorption. So the key question now, and this is what you were getting at in, with your, and trying to answer with the HADL hypothesis is, when someone does eat a high saturated fat diet, where do all the additional cholesterol molecules that end up in the LDL particle come from? If it's not, it's not from increased synthesis, it's not from increased absorption, where are they actually coming from? It's magic. Well, that's what we're going to spend the rest of the time answering, right? But that's, that's, exactly. that's really the fundamental question that you were trying to answer in developing this hypothesis. Absolutely. And uh, I think it's a, that's a million dollar question. And I, I'm a little bit um, confused why not more people have asked this question because it's right. so central for the whole cholesterol. Right. Right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll get to, uh, you have the benefit already of, I say benefit because I think it's, it's really useful and helpful for, uh, you know, a theory or, or a hypothesis to be challenged because it helps us to get even more clear on, on, you know, parts of it that may not have been as clear. And so we we'll, we can talk a little bit about one of the responses that you've received and, and their explanation for, for what's happening here, which didn't seem satisfactory to me. And I don't think is satisfactory to you. And we can talk about why, but we're getting a little ahead of ourselves here. Let's first talk about, you know, what is, can you give us an overview of the HADL hypothesis, including what that acronym stands for and how it addresses this question that we just asked and, and as well as the other uh, shortcomings of the diet heart hypothesis. Yeah, so, so the HALDA model, it stands for the homeoviscous adaptation to dietary lipids model. So that doesn't exactly- That's why we have the acronym. HADL is better. And we'll be using <laughs> exactly. that throughout the rest of the show. Um, so um, to explain the model, we need to talk a little bit about the fatty acids that we eat. And we need to talk about cells and cell membranes. <laughs> because when we eat uh, different types of fatty acids, uh, they will, some of them will end up in our cell membranes. And of course we have, I don't remember how many, but trillions of cells in our body. So, so there are loads and loads of cells that will receive these um, dietary fatty acids. And the type of dietary fatty acids that we eat uh, will change the fluidity of those cell membranes. And that fluidity is crucial for the function of those cells to keep all the proteins in order that do all this, control all everything that goes in and out of the cells and cell signaling and all these, um, all these functions. So, um, so what we're sort of posing is that if you're eating um, uh, a diet rich in polyunsaturated fatty acids, PUFAs, we could call them for simplicity, um, those are, um, they're, they're making the membrane more fluid because these molecules, they, they kink at the double bonds. So they sort of, they can't pack that tightly together. So yeah, and for, the, for the listeners, just think of uh, sunflower oil or safflower oil, it's liquid right yeah. at room temperature, whereas a saturated fat like butter or coconut oil will be solid. So you can think about that happening in a cell membrane to give you an idea of, of what's going on. Yeah, exactly. So if you're eating a lot of uh, PUFAs, then your cell membrane will become more fluid and the cell needs to adjust this. And the way it does that is by incorporating more cholesterol because cholesterol works as, uh, it sort of restricts the movement in, in the membrane. 
Uh, and of course, that cell needs to get that cholesterol from somewhere. So now it will, uh, it, it can both increase uh, its own production, and it will do uh, that, but it will also increase the uptake from the bloodstream, from the LDL particles that travel around the blood. And um, yeah. Um, so let me just stop you there, because I want to make sure everyone's following this. It, it, for those who don't have a background in in biology or nu nutritional science, it could be tricky. So. So what you're saying there is when, when somebody eats more polyunsaturated fat or PUFA, the cell membrane becomes more fluid and then they, the cell needs to, to, to bring in more cholesterol because cholesterol has a stabilizing effect on the membrane. And one way for, for that to happen is this, the production of more cholesterol. But the, the other way for that to happen is that the cell will uh, incorporate cholesterol from, will, will take it out of essentially LDL particles that are normally just carrying around cholesterol in the bloodstream. And so what you would expect to see in that scenario then is a decrease in the amount of cholesterol carried by LDL particles. And that's exactly what you measure on a standard lipid panel. When you see LDL cholesterol, that's what it's referring to. How much cholesterol is being carried by the LDL particles. And in this scenario, it's gonna be less because yeah. the cell membranes are taking it up to compensate for that extra fluidity from the high PUFA intake. Yes, exactly. So, so what we're doing with this model is shifting the view just from the, not just looking at the lipoproteins in the blood, but we're looking at the whole body cholesterol. All of the other cells and all, how all of the other cells use cholesterol. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So then, um, so then these cells will then, they will increase the LDL receptors on the surface and take up those particles to right. make sure they get enough cholesterol. And we also know that in that situation, uh, we know from studies that they will, the cells will take in the LDL particles, they will transport the cholesterol towards the membrane first uh, to, to meet the needs of the membrane, and then the rest will be transported back into the middle of the cell to sort of to regulate production. Interesting. Interesting. So that, that's also important to understand those mechanisms because it indicates the, bi the priority system, <laughs> essentially. Exactly. The, yeah. the fact that it gets incorporated into the membrane first means that this is a high priority biologically, and, right. and that also, I think, lends credence to this hypothesis, because if, if, it's, if that's what's going on, it means that that's an essential function of cholesterol. And, you know, it's so, cholesterol so often has just been seen as, some, as bad, right? As something that, you know, if we could get it to zero, we should. Be, Absolutely. Which, of course, any scientist who studies cholesterol knows that we, that's, we would die if that happened. <laughs> There's smith lemley opitz syndrome, which is a genetic condition that causes extremely low cholesterol levels, which can be fatal. But the, the sort of prevailing attitude, I think, has been that cholesterol is useless and only serves the function of killing us, you know, giving us heart attacks, clogging our arteries, giving us strokes, et cetera. But you're pointing out here with this model that no, cholesterol has essential functions in, you know, in this case, in terms of regulating cell membrane fluidity and structure, and that we've totally ignored those fun functions in how we understand, you know, dietary intake of saturated fat and its effect on our health. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and you know, all the, the years when I've been studying and teaching nutrition and, you know, talking to all the nutrition pro professionals, no one seems to be talking about the membranes. <laughs> right, right. Which, look, I mean, you, that's that, it's hard to imagine a more important function, right? Like cell, yeah. cells, cells run everything, uh, <laughs> no cells, no life, and no membrane, no cell, right? Like the cell yeah. membrane is, is a critical uh, part of the cell. So let's look at what happens in reverse. What you just described is why in general, because again, we know there's lots of inter-individual variation, but it, what you just described explains why people who go on a high PUFA diet typically on average have lower cholesterol, lower LDL cholesterol levels. But let's look at, so, so the flip side, the opposite yeah. of that, when somebody goes on a high saturated fat diet, it's basically everything in reverse, but why don't you just go through that to, to, so it's clear for everybody. Sure. So, so this is what we've seen in, in lots of those interventions that are sort of the, the fundamental for the, the diet heart hypothesis, right? So if a person is eating uh, or 
is given an intervention with a lot of saturated fatty acids. Um, and then usually this is done with uh, subtracting the PUFAs. <laughs> right. So they don't, typically don't give them at the same time. So then you give just the sat saturated fatty acids. So now the opposite will happen. So there won't be a lot of PUFAs in the membrane. So the membranes will be less fluid. And when they're less fluid, they will pack more tightly together. And they won't need that cholesterol to, to stabilize the membrane. So they, they will have to get rid of the cholesterol to, to make sure the, the membrane's not too stiff because it has to be the, just the right fluidity. Um, and the cells will do that by directing the cholesterol inwards in the, in the cell. And then, of course, um, too much cholesterol in the cell is toxic to, to the cell. So now it needs to get rid of the cholesterol. And it would do that by increasing the transportation out from the cell by specialized transporters. This is what we call cholesterol efflux. And this cholesterol will be received by the HDL particle. And this is why we see that the HDL particle tend to, to go up. Incre increase as well with a high saturated fat intake, yeah. And also because that now the cell doesn't need cholest more cholesterol, it has too much mm -hmm. cholesterol, it will, uh, will downregulate it on its own production and it will also downregulate these uh, LDL receptors. LDL. It will Which... stop taking up from the right. circulation. So that's wanna... when LDL rises. I want to pause for a moment and point out that, you know, we earlier we talked about some of the factors that lead to different responses to saturated fat in the diet. And one is genetic. And within that genetic category, one of the, the main, if not the primary response is a down regulation of the LDL receptor. We know that some people just genetically have, you know, fewer LDL receptors or less active LDL receptors. So that's already a well-established mechanism for how, why cholesterol would be higher in certain individuals. This is a different explanation or at least a different reason for how that, when that mechanism is, is in effect. Instead of being a genetic cause, it's related to diet. It's the body responding in a natural way to changes in dietary saturated fat intake and using the LDL receptor is one of the mechanisms to regulate cholesterol levels in the cell membrane and in the cell. Yeah, and this, of course, this, uh, if, if we think about this uh, in an um, evolutionary way, this is a huge um, benefit to us because we're omnivore, we're an omnivore species and we need to adjust these cell membranes with very varying intake of, of foods and, uh, and sources of fat. So, um, yeah. So right, so if you're, if you're an Inuit, living in the Arctic and you're eating seal blubber, you know, and, and lots of, and other sources like other fat, other types of fat, both saturated. You look at ancestral diets. This is a fundamental principle of the ancestral hypothesis, right? Is not, is, it's not so much about what the diets shared in common. It's what they didn't, or, or, you know, what they included is what they didn't include. Right. Cause we see evidence of people being healthy on very high intakes of saturated fat. Uh, the Maasai come to mind, right? And then we see people being healthy on very high intake of carbohydrate, like uh, the Tukacenta who ate mostly sweet potatoes and some insects and not much else. And one way of explaining that, which is what you just said, is that the body has multiple mechanisms for adjusting uh, and meeting its own biological and biochemical needs with widely varying intake of macronutrients yeah absolutely and we can you know we can even move from <laughs> from these different food environments and and we also have probably done you know with seasonal variations these things so, so but you could you could live with the maasai and eat like the maasai and then you could go to the uh, to the Kitava islands and eat like they did and yeah. the body will simply adapt so so this is these are adaptive mechanisms. Um, but um, so, yeah, this model it really explains the changes in cholesterol levels in the blood as a um, uh, necessary and like a, adaptive mechanism to, right. to, to maintain cell function, uh, even with changing sources of, uh, of fatty acids. And, and it's, you know, it's 
there's constantly this exchange going on between the blood and the tissues to uh, make sure that works perfectly. So let's talk about something that I mentioned earlier, which is the influence of time on all of this. So, and I'll, uh, we can launch into it with a clinical scenario. You know, sometimes someone will switch, they'll be, they've been on like lower fat diet for a while and they, they switched, you know, uh, they hear about a ketogenic diet and they want to try it and they switch to it and their lipids, you know, their LDL goes through the roof. Why should we be skeptical or cautious of in, in interpreting studies on dietary fat intervention that are two weeks long or, or even two months long? And what have longer term studies on the impact of dietary fat shown? Well, the problem is we don't really have that many long term studies. <laughs> There's really a lack of studies having um, the test of the effect of a um, high SFA intervention for a long time, for more than just a few weeks. Um, there is one, uh, it's called carb funk. No, it's called, no, sorry, it's the wrong one. It's called fat funk. <laughs> uh, and they have data um, from eight weeks, uh, four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks. So that's on a low carb diet. And they see initially that the LDL goes up. But then they see at 12 weeks, it starts to go down again. So this might be like a long-term down regulation when, when the body has um, re-established uh, homeostasis. Um, but we don't really know that. And, and we, we need more studies um, to, to be sure what's going on in the long term. I've also seen uh, long-term results from ketogenic diets where um, the LDL levels don't really go down but the phenotype changes. So they go from the small dense ones to the, to the large ones. So there has definitely been something going on, but um, I think this might also be different in unhealthy and healthy individuals. It might be that in metabolically unhealthy individu individuals, you would see initially a, a rise in LDL. And then as soon as their metabolism sort of um, gets better, uh, it will go down again and then establish at the level that's right for that individual. I think if everything else is, is normal, all the other per parameters are good, then that LDL level is the right for that person. Possibly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, this, this is one of the reasons, unfortunately, there's not, there aren't, these studies are expensive, especially if you're doing metabolic ward studies and if there's no drug discovery or development process at the end of that, it's, uh, it's hard to get that kind of study funded. And Absolutely. you know, if you're a statin drug manufacturer, you're not going to really have a whole lot of interest in funding that study um, because the outcome is not really going to be beneficial to you. But let's talk about a little bit more about the concept that you've just introduced, which is that I mean, we, and we touched on it before, that one of the reasons for the variable responses to dietary fatty acids is the, uh, the metabolic health or, or uh, you know, other aspects of health of the, of the person in question. And uh, I thought two things that stood out to me from your paper that were quite interesting and in alignment with uh, you know, other research that I've done and, and uh, or that I've seen is two of those factors that determine how people respond to dietary fatty acids are inflammation and gut microbiota. And I, I would say kind of the, the prevailing paradigm or hypothesis right now is that you gain weight and inflammation happens as a result of that. Or, you know, it, even like that inflammation is a cause, a kind of independent and distinct contributing factor to cardiovascular disease that together with high lipids, you know, makes it worse than if you just had high lipids at all. But one of your, if I understood it correctly, one part of your hypothesis is that inflammation may actually be a causal factor for having, you know, high cholesterol, or high LDL cholesterol, which is something that's fundamentally different than what has been proposed before. Yeah, so uh, we definitely know that inflammation has the potential to affect lipid metabolism, um, like it, it does uh, affect other types of these 
homo other types of homo homeostasis like glucose uh, uh, homeostasis and, right. and we know that um, inflammation can sort of interfere with lots of signaling pathways and I, I think we're only um, starting to to figure these things out there hasn't been that many studies but but I know it's well known that in insulin resistance uh, inflammation is interfering with the function of the LDL receptor we know also from animal studies that inflammation can interfere with for instance uh, pathways for satiety and weight regulation we know that it can interfere with the um, um, some neurotransmitters like uh, serotonin so it affects mood but and so it's not it doesn't seem completely far-fetched to think that inflammation could mess up some of the <laughs> pathways important right. for for uh, lipid metabolism as well um we don't know if it sort of um interferes with the uptake via the ldl receptor i haven't seen any evidence on that uh, but I have seen uh, there are at least there are animal studies showing that inflammation will inhibit some of these nuclear receptors that involved in lipid homeostasis. For instance, those efflux transport proteins that we talked about earlier. So they will. So inflammation will probably can probably uh, explain why HDL is low in metabolically unhealthy people. That's at least something we know from animal studies. Uh, so that could probably explain this um, observation in, in humans if, it's, um, if it proves to be the same. So um, I, I think the role of inflammation in lipid metabolism is sort of still in its infancy, but there's definitely something going on there um, that we need to, to figure out. Right. And the gut microbiota, I think this is... I've seen quite a bit of research on this topic, and uh, but what's what do you think is the mechanism here where if you have uh, dysregulated gut microbiota, maybe from taking too many courses of antibiotics or any of the other multiple factors that affect the gut flora, how might that impact lipid metabolism? Yeah, so that would be um, that would be the link with the inflammation, or it could at least explain some of the the low grade inflammation that's seen in. Uh, uh, in people with metabolic disorders. Um, so we know that uh, gut microbiota can, um, we can induce inflammation uh, in humans. And, and there are probably, there are loads of dietary factors that can influence uh, inflammation, gut inflammation that can be sort of uh, transferred to the whole, <laughs> to the circulation and, and work at the systemic level. Right. So you have endotoxins, maybe like lipopolysaccharide that are produced in the gut and then cross through the, the permeable gut barrier, end up in the bloodstream and then provoke an inflammatory, systemic inflammatory res low grade response. Uh, not just through the, the barrier, they also they enter the, the chylomicrons. So they right. also travel by the normal uptake mechanism of uh, lipids. And, and that's seen in studies that in obese people, and they have first they have more bacteria growing in in their um, small intestine and then oh. also more of these bacterial products like the lps will be taken up by the chylomicrons and and, and will enter the circulation and increase the uh, endotoxemia endotoxemia after like a post right so you have multiple you have a pa sort of pathological mechanism per se when if you could say if, if that person has intestinal permeability like an inappropriately permeable gut barrier because our gut barrier of course has appropriate permeability that's how we extract nutrients from the food we eat but then you have like a a very normal physiological mechanism which you know is the normal uptake of chylomicrons but in but in the case where there's overgrowth of bacteria in the small intestine where that happens then those bacteria hitch a ride so to speak, in, in the chylomicrons and can produce that endotoxemia and that inflammation, even when there's no leaky gut or, or intestinal yeah. permeability present. Okay. Yeah. So I think we, we need to ask the question, what, uh, what leads to uh, a lot of LPS producing bacteria in, in the gut? And we need to make sure <laughs> that, we have, that we eat diets that won't 
facilitate this kind of growth of bacteria and this kind of transfer of uh, bacterial products into the bloodstream. Right. So I think that's, uh, and, and in that um, context, uh, dietary lipids are less important. Um, they can work as uh, transport molecules, sort of, uh, but what causes the bacterial overgrowth um, in the first place and, and like pro-inflammatory gut microbiota, the, those are different factors. So yeah. that's probably... A cellular uh, carbohydrates. <laughs> yes, exactly. So it's the, the refined carbohydrates. And, and also we know that some kind of additives can also induce inflammation in the gut. So right. maybe it's time to ask if we have been barking up the wrong tree when it comes to prevention of, of CBD. Certainly a lot of evidence pointing in that direction. And I think that the Haddle hypothesis is a phenomenal contribution to understanding the mechanisms behind that. So let's talk a little bit about implications. What, you know, what does this mean for the average person? And you know, one kind of conclusion that emerges right away, if you're following you know, all of the threads here, is that let's say somebody goes on a a uh, high fat diet, you know, low carb, ketogenic, whatever, and they see an increase in their, let's go back to the hypothetical person that I was talking about before, they see an increase in their, in their LDL, but their C-reactive protein and interleukin-6 and ferritin and other inflammatory markers go down, their blood sugar glucose goes down, their weight drops, their visceral fat decreases, their blood pressure decreases, everything else, every other marker that we know of that, you know, is an indicator of, of metabolic and cardiovascular health improves. Let's consider that scenario. And then let's, let's say somebody else does the same intervention and their LDL also skyrockets. But in that case, all of those other markers don't improve. Maybe some of them even get worse. Maybe their inflammatory markers go up. Um, you know, they don't really lose that much weight. It's just, you know, they, they might get some kind of mix of improvement and worsening, but overall, not nearly, you know, a lot of the other metabolic and inflammatory markers are, are the same or worse. Would you think that we should approach those two people in the same way? <laughs> kind of a leading question, but, <laughs> <laughs> and I am no clinician. Uh, yeah. I have to point that out. And I also have to, um, we have to remind ourselves that this is still in a hypothesis. So yeah, this hypothesis also has to be confirmed before we can yeah, draw any conclusions. But uh, well, let's say it's, um, it holds water <laughs> in the coming years. And I think that in that first scenario that you're, you're painting, I think um, there is no need for, for the doctor to freak out. There's no need to go on a statin because <laughs> of the elevation in LDL cholesterol and, you know, all these factors that you mentioned, it's an indication that the, the body is really repairing itself. It's, it's re-establishing a, a normal homeostasis. So it doesn't really make sense that this one measurement is off and means something pathological. Why would it when everything else is, the body is fixing itself? So maybe that's part of that <laughs> process. Maybe we should... Yeah reconsider the the role of the LDL particle in this uh, this way and also that's that's a sign of a functioning body you know that that person is able to adjust the amount of cholesterol between bloods and tissues in this right. situation that, right yeah and and also the response in in healthy people i think that uh, the increase in LDL cholesterol from a lot of saturated fatty acids, that's a, that's a sign of a healthy response. Right. But then the other person you're describing, uh, I'm not uh, so sure about <laughs> uh, what to do with the, with him or her, but um, there might be, um, we can't rule out the possibility that in that situation, um, um, sustained elevated L LDL particle level might do something that it wouldn't have done in a healthy body. But I don't know, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I agree. We, we still need more information, you know, more, more data to, to try to figure this out. But I, it's basically how I have approached things as a clinician for some time now. Um, the way I explain it to patients is you have to consider the net effect of an intervention. So if, you, if you're you know, pre-diabetic or even diabetic 
and you've, you've got metabolic syndrome, you go on a ketogenic diet and it, and it improves, you know, 99% of, of the markers and objective things that we can measure and, uh, you know, as indicators of your health and also subjective measures, which I don't discount. And one person, you know, one marker gets a lot worse Then to me, the net effect of that intervention is still overwhelmingly positive. And so I, I would encourage that as an intervention um, for, for someone in that situation. In the second scenario, the net effect is much more murkier. Um, you know, maybe the net effect was either neutral or actually even negative. Um, if they didn't really lose significant weight, their LDL went up considerably, their metabolic markers maybe changed a little bit, but their inflammatory markers went up. To me, that's that's less of a slam dunk. And maybe in that case, I might try something like a protein sparing modified fast, or I might try, you know, more fasting or a potato hack or, you know, some other strategy that might, and to test that out and see if that leads to weight loss or changes in, in metabolic markers. And so I think we, Unfortunately, because of the lack of research that you mentioned before, and you know, maybe I'm a little skeptical or pessimistic here that I don't think we are going to have these studies anytime soon that answer this question. I, I hope I'm wrong, and I hope we do see these longer term studies. I mean, to me, the study I'd like to see, and I, I actually, I, I, I talked to Dr. Vliet, that do you know, I think you know, do you know his work? Um, I could be pronouncing his name, Stefan Vliet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah, know. so he is doing a, an RCT on the effects of saturated fat, but it's going to be relatively short term because, again, the, you know, doing a two year RCT and metabolic word study would be r ridiculously expensive. So for me as a clinician, I think the only way in the very short term until we until we have that research is is to just look at the net impact of the intervention and not get hung up on any single marker and consider health from a more holistic point of view. That's how I've approached it. Absolutely. I, I think that uh, if our model proves to be to be correct, uh, I think it might take a little bit of the uh, um, well, it might make the ketogenic diets more, um, what's the word? <laughs> Accepted. Yeah, Accept yeah, exactly. It's palatable for clinicians. They're not yeah. going to freak out, like you said, yeah. when they see LDL go up. And, and we, need that. we need therapeutic tools, as you pointed out uh, in our email correspondence. You know, one in three Americans now have prediabetes or diabetes. We have 60% rate of, uh, I think it's actually 70% overweight now and 42% are obese. We mm. desperate, we need help. We desperately need tools that can help reverse this and ketogenic and low carb diets have been sh shown over and over in studies to be effective tools. And so anything that could remove the barrier or resistance Absolutely. to mm. implementing these in clinical practice is, is very welcome. So I hope that you know, you're able to do the research that is needed, you, know, you and others perhaps to, to confirm this hypothesis and that it makes it makes the difficult and arduous journey from the realm of research science to primary care. As you know, that's a long road and it's, there's lots of obstacles on that road and, uh, you know, certain vested interests that are financially not uh, you know deeply invested in the current status quo paradigm that may not want the the, the paradigm to change, um, but I think this is a really great first step in that direction. One last thing before we finish up, there was a a letter. I forget what journal it was published in. It was in the same journal the study was published in. So that that raised some criticisms of the Haddle hypothesis. Um, since we're running out of time, I don't, we don't have time to go through each, each one, but maybe if you could uh, highlight either, if you can choose what, 
you think makes the most sense, either kind of an overview of their criticisms and then your rebuttal or a, you know, a specific criticism that stood out or that you think was kind of one of their primary arguments and then the, the rebuttal to that. Yeah, so um, this letter to editor came from um, some people who are, you know, work in a kind of, in groups where the, the diet heart hypothesis is central to their work. So of course, probably didn't resonate so well with them. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so the title yeah. of the, these, these letters are, are coming soon. They haven't been published yet, but they will, they will uh, be published pretty soon, I think. Um, a few, they, they raised quite a few points and some of them are not really relevant for, uh, or aren't really um, in conflict with the models. So we chose not to, right. to respond to those. Um, right. They, they, Raise the question of, uh, for instance, um, the fluidity of these, uh, how the dietary fatty acids will affect the fluidity of the membrane. So they say, like, if this was related to the to the melting point, then you would have you'd be able to predict the response in LDL cholesterol from the melting point of those. Exactly. How uh, saturated or how unsaturated the sat the yeah. fat is? Yeah. Uh, and this is not what we see in interventions. So so like they say, this is sort of an um, objection to the model. Uh, however, uh, what's interesting is, or what we, our response was that these fatty acids aren't just uh, incorporated into the membranes and um, so they, they're incorporated in a very regulated manner. Right. So, so the cell will, um, will modify them it, if it needs to, to adjust the fluidity. So, right. so the longer ones that are typically stiffer and that you would think would cause uh, a certain effect, they are typically modified by, by adding double bonds before they're uh, in, incorporated into the phospholipids of the cell membrane. So, um, yeah, so, so that's why you can't really extrapolate from the melting point. Uh, and another point they raised was the, the temporal issue. So they said that this is not happening so fast. So if this is a regulation that the cell needs to do to function, that would happen like really quickly. And we see these changes typically in a few weeks time. Uh, but, you know, there there aren't that many studies that that had to have tested they haven't really tested what happens after two days after one day four days. after four hours after etc yeah, yeah exactly so they, mm -hmm. they typically just measure after two three weeks so that's uh, and then we assume that these changes happen after two three weeks but we do have some um uh, some data from uh, that's cell cultures where they load these culture these cells with omega-3 fatty acids and they see they start immediately by exchanging their uh, their membrane lipids and adding more cholesterol. So we know this is going on in a cell culture, but of course we we haven't shown that this is going on uh, in an organism. Um, mm -hmm. But it seems like this is happening a lot quicker than. Um, so than that maybe. that seems like a fruitful area of research that is would be not excessively costly or or you know difficult to to do as a study. It's just pretty clear question that you're setting out to answer and pretty clear path for answering it. So is that, are you plan, is that a, a plan of yours or any other research group that you know of at this point? Um, I don't have a lab. I'm not connected to yeah. a lab. So yeah. <laughs> I would have to. You're, you're more like, you're like a, you're like a theoretical physicist or something, the, the equivalent. <laughs> you need to hook up with an, a, an experimental, uh, someone who can perform these experiments in the lab Absolutely, but of course yeah. we're hoping to see see publications uh, tagged with the Haddle model in the upcoming yeah. years and yeah. We'll see. yeah great well thank you so much Marit. it's been a pleasure to speak with you and it's it's really a fascinating hypothesis and and i hope that it gets the it continues to get the attention that it deserves because uh there are some real glaring issues with the diet heart hypothesis that have been raised by many different people in many contexts over the years and hundreds, if not thousands of, of papers that are critical of the diet heart hypothesis, De definitely thousands, I think maybe, maybe even tens of thousands at this point. So it's not like you've just been working as a mad scientist in, in, in your, you know, in your office in, in Oslo and coming up with this stuff on your own. This, this is building on 
the huge amount of research that has already raised questions and, and you outlined some of those with the in the three three parts of the diet heart hypothesis and, and the, the problems with each part but the response so far seems to have been to just consider those as kind of uh, to use Al Gore's term inconvenient <laughs> truths right that that they just they're there and we don't know how to explain them but they're inconvenient so we're just not going to even try to explain them and uh, what I appreciate about what you've done is you've actually peeled back that that layer of the onion and and um, really um, taken the time to try to explain those findings and I and it, you know at least from my perspective it's a very sensible hypothesis with some good evidence behind it and it certainly deserves more explanation and and to be confirmed or at least iterated on and you know improved in some way if it's not accurate the way that you've outlined it so hopefully that will that will happen soon yeah and um, thanks um and um what we hope is that this will sort of spark a, a better conversation on on what we should eat what yes. are the best human diets absolutely and what i like about this hypothesis as well is it you know, I've from the beginning when I first, you know, my first book all the way back to my first book in 2013, one of my mantras has always been there's no one size fits all approach. And that the idea that there's like a single diet that is going to work for everybody is preposterous <laughs> for so many reasons. And this, this is very much in alignment with that, like that, that you're actually there's a way of explaining how, you know, high cholesterol might mean different things for different people in different contexts at different time periods. And that that complexity and nuance in my experience is almost always more likely to be accurate than a very simple binary kind of explanation uh, when it comes to the body. Absolutely. And also we need to consider the the human adaptive biology when we right. study nutrition. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of years of evolutionary wisdom that's gone into those mechanisms, right? And it's sometimes foolish to underestimate their sophistication. So, all right, well, thanks again. And thank you everybody for listening. Keep sending your questions in, chriscresser.com slash podcast question, and we'll talk to you next time. Just a quick reminder to head over to cresser.co slash podcast survey to help us make the show even better. It takes only about three to five minutes to complete and you'll be entered into a drawing to receive a free three-year membership to Thrive Market. I'm so grateful for your help. That's cresser.co slash podcast survey. That's the end of this episode of Revolution Health Radio. If you appreciate the show and want to help me create a healthier and happier world, please head over to iTunes and leave us a review. They really do make a difference. If you'd like to ask a question for me to answer on a future episode, you can do that at chriscresser.com slash podcast question. You can also leave a suggestion for someone you'd like me to interview there. If you're on social media, you can follow me at twitter.com slash chriscresser or facebook.com slash chriscresserlac. I post a lot of articles and research that I do throughout the week there that never makes it to the blog or podcast, so it's a great way to stay abreast of the latest developments. Thanks so much for listening. Talk to you next time.